Welcome to the Journey Mama Writings Podcast. I'm Rachel Devonish Ford, the author of the Journey Mama blog and books, and I'm currently recording my audiobooks. I'll be releasing the Journey Mama Writings complete as audiobooks, but also here in podcast format with hindsight, which is a section at the end of each episode where I share my thoughts on my experiences all those years ago. This is season one, where I read the book Trees Tall as Mountains, the first book in the Journey Mama writing series. I write many kinds of fiction, including YA fantasy, inspirational romance, and literary fiction. You can find my books on journeymama.com, and you can subscribe to get my posts or writing in your inbox. This podcast episode is published by Small Seed Press and is sponsored by my patrons at patreon.com forward slash journey mama. On Patreon, my patrons receive daily poetry and other offerings, including early peeks at new books and ebooks when they are complete. I'm so thankful for them. They make everything I do possible. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and follow me at journeymama.com or on Instagram where I'm at Journey Mama. Welcome to episode four. This episode contains posts from July 2006 to August 2006. With hindsight. July. July 6th, 2006. I'm out of the woods, and I have lots of stories to tell. But today I walked three miles in the dust and sun with a baby on my front and a toddler on my back and a preschooler holding my hand. So I'm a wee bit tired, and I need a shower. I smell like campfire. July 9th, 2006. Here's a story. One night, as we were on our way out to Colorado, I was driving the RV, and I realized that I could not drive any further. I pulled over at a rest stop to switch with Chinua. We were all joking around, and as Chinua was getting settled, he said to Derek, Why don't you take care of this trash, trash boy? I don't know why he called him trash boy or why it seemed funny. Please remember that this was on day four of our road trip after one breakdown and a whole lot of errands. So Derek said, Well, since we're here... I'll jump off and throw it in the trash at this rest stop. And I said, since you're going to do that, I'll get myself something to drink from the vending machine. I'm parched. And out we went, through the door, having communicated that we were leaving the vehicle. Except it seems that we were talking to ourselves. A few moments later, I was standing at the soda machine, kicking it because it ate my money. I never even got a soda out of this. When Derek walked over to me and asked, how long do you think it will take them to realize they've left us? He said he dumped the trash and then stood watching in utter disbelief as the RV re-entered the freeway in Utah at about 11 o'clock at night. Of course, neither of us had our cell phones on us. It occurred to me that it could take them a really long time to realize we weren't there. They would assume that I was in the back with the kids who were drifting off to sleep. Maybe they would think that Derek was in the bathroom or something, the only people in the RV were the kids, Chinua in the driver's seat, Chris in the passenger seat, and Paul, who was sleeping in the compartment above the driver. Not being in the most observant of moods, Chris and Chinua might never turn around. I came up with a plan to call a friend collect and get that friend to call my cell phone. Lavon was pretty amused about the situation, and she did call and get through, except that when she called and asked if anyone was missing... They had already discovered their big mistake. Kai was the hero. Chinua says that he ran straight up to where they were and said, I want Mama. Chinua said, well, then go in the back where she is. Kai wailed, she's not back there. You left her. <laughs> At this point, Chris turned around and said, where's Derek? Then he started to moan, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, where's Paul? Paul, Paul, they cried until Paul spoke from the bed above the driver's seat and said, I'm right here. Chinua described it as horrific. We had disappeared. We simply weren't there. 
They hadn't even heard us leave the RV, so they had to assume that we were back at that rest stop. All the exits in this country section of Utah were amazingly far apart, so they had to drive a long way to turn around, drive past the rest stop exit, drive another long way to another exit to turn around again, and then come and get us. Leaving your wife at a rest stop at night is ill-advised. I don't recommend it, but I do recommend profuse apologies and exclamations of horror over your mistake, which is what Chinua did, and another example of why he's a superstar husband. July 11th, 2006. 1. I really, really should be in bed right now. Oh, why am I not in bed? 2. I am sorry for everyone who doesn't have the leaf baby. He is amazing. I could hang out with him all day long. He drools and smiles and creaks out some song, and I just don't want this time to pass. 3. We spent a lot of time at the Rainbow Gathering trekking up and down new trails. We hauled gear. I hauled babies, sometimes with a little one on my front and a big old long girl named Kenya on my back. Miles of walking, miles of lifting. We are now so ripped that we could pose as bodybuilders. Thankfully, all the walking was through amazing vistas of hills and mountains with tall aspens and pines, a stunning valley with the creek and wildflowers everywhere. I loved getting out of my tent first thing in the morning and being outdoors immediately. Four. I did nine loads of laundry at the laundromat today. All the guys hauled stuff out of the gathering for two days in the mud that was created by the rain that Colorado was praying for and unexpectedly received. Mud everywhere. Wetness and clothes and blankets and sleeping bags. Laundry. I've always loved coin laundry. I even wrote a poem about it once. I think that laundry is my favorite chore, although that is seriously getting tested with the amount that I'm doing these days. 5. My kids love dust more than they love Dora and Diego, more than chocolate rice milk, more than putting small round objects in their mouths. They may even love dust more than they love whining. They love to sit in it, to pile it on their clothes, to rub it into each other's hair. They would take baths in dust if they could. This was their primary occupation for the two weeks that they were at the gathering, playing in clinging, dirty, nasty dust. 6. I dropped a pot of boiling water on my foot while getting ready to cook oatmeal over the fire. I was adding more wood to the fire, standing in the beautiful Celtic Trinity knot-shaped fire pit, when I accidentally knocked the whole boiling thing on my poor self. Thankfully, I was able to run over to Chris very quickly and scream at him, to pour cold water on me, but I was definitely burnt. While walking barefoot to try to let it heal, I split my toe open on a root. These things both happened to me as punishment for mocking Chinua about his tendency to trip as he walks without watching the ground. July 23rd, 2006. Yesterday, my brain melted. It was 111 degrees here, and I couldn't help it. It just melted. I shouldn't be complaining, though. Megan holds the record for the all-time best attitude shown by an almost eight-month pregnant woman in 111-degree heat. Our favorite time of day is around 4.30 in the afternoon, when the sun isn't as dangerous, and we walk down to the river, and then we just sit in it. We have a great piece of river here, and some parts are shallow, while some parts are deep enough to dive into, off of the large rocks that line it. And we sit, Megan and I, and talk about how good we feel in the water. Mark and Chinua swim or dive or play with the kids, but Megan and I just let the water treat us like old friends. Last night at about 3 a.m., I woke up feeling like I was going to suffocate in the still, hot air. And I had to get up and pour myself an ice-cold bath. I splashed it all over myself until I became really cold and felt like I was having a heart attack. Only then did I get back out and go to sleep. One more thing, and then I'll stop complaining. The hottest weather that I've ever been subjected to was in Varanasi, India, for five days in the hot season. It was 46 degrees Celsius, which is about 126 degrees Fahrenheit. Chinua and I and our friends got stuck there when the police declared a curfew on the whole city because of Hindu-Muslim violence. The power went off periodically all day long, and we spent our whole time there moving between our guesthouse and the one restaurant we were allowed to visit 
Five Doors Down, which for some odd reason is called the Mona Lisa. We ate sapagiti, spaghetti, and rice pudding, bowl ramen, menu English for a bowl of ramen, and banana porridge. We lay staring at the ceiling fans with longing during the frequent power outs. We soaked our sheets in cold water at night to try to make our beds cool. We mainly stayed out of the heat in the middle of the day, except for me when I ignored a warning and went out for a walk at noon, only to develop heat stroke and a fever. We didn't have to take care of children. We didn't have whimpering, sweaty little babies. We didn't do dishes. I didn't have office work. We hung out and tried to stay cool, talked to our fellow prisoners, a man from Hong Kong who grew up in Britain named Kun Ming, and a Japanese boy named Hiro, and waited to catch the first train out of there. Yesterday, it wasn't far from being as hot as it was there. We don't have AC here either, although so far, thankfully, the power has not shut off. I love being in the river with my kids. I love how Kenya hugs me and how she looks in her little orange life jacket, how their wet kisses feel, how excited they are to be there. This is the first summer that Kai has liked swimming, and yesterday we even brought the leaf baby in, since the water was so warm. There's nothing to improve your spirits on a wickedly hot day like holding a little naked baby in a beautiful green river with the tall trees rising up around you. July 25th, 2006. I feel like I always come back to this place. The sad place. The anxious place. The I'll never be different place. It's a stupid place. A muddy hole just big enough for me to stand in by myself, unable to get a good enough grip on the edges to climb out. You probably have a hole of some sort too. Maybe your hole is deeper or more shallow or muddier, but we all probably agree that the holes suck. There are some things that I know now about the hole, which is good. I know a little bit about how I got there. I know that I won't stay there. And I know that it is not my home. How did I get there? Well, it was a little over two years ago that someone asked me why I walked around with my shoulders so high. And at the same time, I'd been having stomach pain every day, like I had swallowed a roll of quarters. Through the advice of my sister and some friends, I saw that I was having problems with anxiety. And as I started to look into it, started to try to pinpoint the things that made me anxious, I began to see that almost everything in my life gave me anxiety, and that the problem was not with my life, it was with me. Well, my life was a little crazy at the time too, but still. I also realized that the hormones that are delivered to my body when I am pregnant or nursing like a shot glass full of insanity, intensify this. I have been pregnant or nursing without a break for four and a half years. But I can look back and also see that anxiety has never been a stranger. I just didn't know that it wasn't a normal way to be. What is normal? Well, I realize that a lot of people may feel anxiety or even struggle with it a lot like I do, but I don't think this is the way we were made to be. And there are words in the Bible that say, be anxious for nothing. So, you know, as in not anxious about everything, I've been working on it. It's been working on me. This blog has been part of it. Writing is cathartic to me. It gives meaning to things. It makes me laugh. I can tell when I've gone too long without writing. It feels a little like bladder pain on a long car ride. So lately, as I've broken all my rules, footnote, I've been sensing the man with the bag creeping up on me. At some point along the line, he caught up with me, threw the bag over my head, and stuck me in the hole. I'm almost out, I think, which is why I can even write about it. At my worst, I can't hold a normal conversation with my superstar husband. If you pressed mute, you might think it was normal, but if you could hear, you would hear things like this. S.H. I'm going to clean off the top of the refrigerator. It's gotten a little out of hand. Me. I was just going to get to that. What are you saying? I'm a slob? Don't you realize how much I have to do around here? I give the list. And I'm not even sleeping at nights. Why don't you try nursing the baby, huh? Or how about that time you left me at a rest stop? I know that has nothing to do with this, but it proves that you're not perfect either. What? I don't know what I'm talking about. I just want to die. That's at my worst. When anxiety keeps me from focusing on anything and I have a vague sense of dread following me around. 
The depression that comes with it makes me want to crawl into bed forever. So the combo is a little neurotic. They're like bad teachers or the kind of bus drivers that yell at you, or like having street cleaners every other day. Do I park the car or not park the car? At my worst, I'm really confused and trying to come up with a reason to not be anxious. At my best, it's okay, and it's below the surface. I'm stepping on its ugly little head, but I can feel it back there waiting. Today I'm a little farther out of the hole, but waking up feeling overwhelmed made me need to write about it and gain a little more ground. One of my favorite psalms has a part that goes like this. If I should say my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. When my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolation delights my soul. Footnote 2. So here I am, mind racing with scaly thoughts, and God has a way to console me and to hold me up. A consolation even for me, even for anxiety, even for a crazy mama who has a hard time breathing sometimes. There is goodness here. There are wide open spaces. Footnote. These are the rules. 1. Get enough sleep. 2. Take your vitamins. 3. Wash your face and brush your teeth. 4. Eat regularly. 5. Don't be too hard on yourself. Footnote 2. Psalm 94, verses 18 and 19. Born. I was born to walk long roads alone, and I have done it. One in particular I remember and dream about. The gray pavement with a long white line stretching until it disappeared in a small point. Like the line I was born to trace around a canvas, measuring the slight barrier between who I am and who they are. The slight barrier the permeable border. I was born to cry into my paint box, take handfuls of paint out and crush them onto dry surfaces, breathe paint fumes deeply. There are so many things in this world to weep about. The children alone, so few to see and weep, so few willing to make colors into dreams, pray murmured words over faint photographs. A painting becomes a name, the right to have a name. I was born to string words onto a thin thread like beads, one after the other, making long trains that tie up my life, keep it steady, muttering, always frowning away. Words bring life, the spoken word creating, the written one a record of the creation. Life becomes visible. The perfect word will set me free. I was born to give birth, to labor long and intensely to have utter joy at the first breath, the slippery body, warm skin, the perfect comfort of the breast, new eyes squinting into bright light, that first meeting. We look at each other in love without knowing, soft speech, but mostly we just look. This part I do well. I was born to find my love and comfort him, to be comforted by him. Has there ever been any love like ours? Our dark nights, the words that should never be said, forgiveness like deep waters, light coming into the room when he does, his voice finding me lost, bringing me back. I never was beautiful until he saw me. I was born to look for hope until my eyes sting with the strain, to wait and watch through the night, to shrug off gentle tries until finally I am broken, clearly unlovable, clearly loved, This is what I was born for, to finally stop fighting and listen, to be soft, to thaw. God beside me takes my clenched hands and opens them. This is the way he is. Broken things are made new. The second year. In the second year, I continued my way through the ups and downs of my emotions, writing about everything under the sun. It was a year of loss and joy. One notable thing about this year is that I finally woke up and realized I was struggling too hard against anxiety and panic. I needed help. I went to my doctor and she prescribed medication, a serotonin uptake inhibitor that is good for depression, but also effective against social anxiety. I still remember my reasons for asking for help. I read the book Love Walked In by Marissa de los Santos. It's not really about self-help, But in the story, a woman lamented the fact that her mother didn't take the steps she should have taken, 
to protect her children from her illness. In her case, alcoholism. Reading that was like someone opening the door to a closed up room. I was waiting for someone to rescue me from the darkness of my mind. But really, I was the one. I was the one who could ask for help and protect my children from my illness because it was affecting them. It can't help but affect your children if you are having fits of panic with toddlers underfoot. In May, I started taking medication, and I can so easily read in between the lines of my writing and see the difference it made to me. I had always been worried that medication would make me a different person. It's probably why I waited so long. Tried so many other things, but in reality, I felt like Rachel again for the first time in years. Oh, I thought, I forgot what it was like to be me. Not the me that was shrouded in darkness even on the sunniest of days, but the me who could see long distances, who laughed in the sun, who will perhaps never be completely lighthearted, but who can find her way through sorrow. August, August 3rd, 2006. Kai is getting his real nose. You know how all kids were born with noses that look like Cabbage Patch Kids' noses? You know, squishy and soft and all cartilage. And then there's a point when they have their real noses. This is a real scientific thing. Only there must be a point when they are metamorphosing from having the Cabbage Patch nose to having the real nose. And there is no cocoon involved. So why don't we talk about this more? Because really and truly, I've been noticing a lot of change with Kai's nose. It's longer, for one thing. And when he makes that annoying sniffing sound that he does when he has a cold, you can see some definite boniness in the bridge. It's no longer as squishy. I take this as a sign that he's growing up. He's turning four next month, and he also always wants to know what highway we're on and whether we need to turn onto any other roads to get where we're going. He notices things like the fact that the sun is getting low and there's going to be a sunset soon. And he's getting his real nose. It's a big step. Of course, in my family, there are three stages to the metamorphosis. My brother and sister would be the first ones to agree to this. We have the cabbage patch nose, the real nose, and then dum dum dum, the puberty nose. The sad thing about the puberty nose is that when it first emerges, it is too large for the face it is occupying. I mean, we all still have largish noses, but in those first days, it was really shocking. I remember crying because a boy in my math class remarked in an incredibly loud and obnoxious voice that I had a huge honker. Boy, what a huge honker Ray has. Hardy har har. The puberty knows is the reason I spent all my rides to school on the bus, scheming a way to sit in the best possible seat for nose concealment. The very, very best were the two back corner seats. It's still habit. I always will pick those seats, though now I couldn't care less about people seeing my nose. You also have my full permission to look at my large feet, my crooked ears, and my sharp tooth. I remember, though, those teenage years when the nose seemed overwhelming, and I looked at pictures of me with the cabbage patch nose and thought, what happened? You started out so great. The puberty nose, like other aspects of puberty, comes a lot slower for boys than girls, so we thought that my brother had pretty much missed it. I traveled for the greater part of a year when I was 18 and he was 14, and I remember how he opened the door when I got home and I looked at him standing there, fully in the throes of the first stage, the one where it doesn't fit your face. Oh, Matt, I said, you got it. I'm so sorry. Of course, now Maddie's face has grown into its nose and I would challenge any of you into a handsome brother duel if you so desire. But it was a sad time for poor Maddie. So Kai is getting his real nose and though I really hope for him that he takes after his dad and doesn't get the puberty nose... I will be right here to help him through it if he does. August 5th, 2006. You've probably heard enough of my incredibly crazy shopping marathons with the kids in tow, but I just have to say a few more things about this one. One, the first thing that happened to me was that I needed to use the bathroom. So I took my target cart and my three kids into the bathroom with me and proceeded to break the button off of my pants, absentmindedly thinking that the button was a snap. You know, I went to unsnap them, except there was no snap. So the button broke off and went flying across the room. Does this happen to anyone else? 
So I walked around with buttonless pants all day, once again, just sweetly trying to affirm everyone's preconceived ideas about frazzled mothers. Two. It happened. My sweet little undemanding boy has started to ask me to buy him things. I loved that he never did this. He was the kind of kid who would point at things and say sweetly, isn't that a nice cookie monster balloon? And then smile and be happy and just hold that picture of the balloon in his heart to be cherished. But some little bird landed on his shoulder and told him that maybe he could have that balloon, that maybe it wasn't enough just to like it. And maybe if he asked for it, I would pull out my magic papers and buy it for him. And so yesterday, he thought he'd try it out on many things. We're going to have to start talking about money and socioeconomic brackets and the fact that this family doesn't just walk into Costco and buy a freestanding basketball hoop. We're at Costco to save money, not spend it on a box of glade-scented candles. We buy lettuce, son, and those big bags of onions, potatoes, and spinach. Also laundry detergent and garbage bags. Okay, well, maybe I'll leave all that stuff out, but still, I'll have to help him understand about his own buying power. Three. Okay, grocery carts. Grocery carts were made with the idea that you might have a more sane child spacing thing going on than I do. The littlest kid rides in the cart and the older kids walk. Or at Costco, the two littlest kids ride in the cart and the oldest one walks. This assumes a lot. It assumes that the kids who are walking have the maturity to do so without causing harm to themselves or others in the store, which isn't so much the case with us. My favorite part of the day was when Kenya was lying on the floor on her back and Kai was dragging her down the aisle by her arm. Or maybe when Kenya was doing the army crawl in the freezer section. The bottom line is that Kenya shouldn't be unrestrained in the grocery store. Although actually she really does well for a two-year-old, I think. But Kenya really shouldn't be unrestrained anywhere when she hasn't had a nap. I guess I just need to get used to my new way of life. Grocery shopping involves a lot more fierce whispering and sometimes a lot of fun. Like when I was heaving the Costco-sized pack of paper towel rolls onto the cart and Kai burst into action. I'm so strong. I can help you. I'm like Superman. I'm so strong. And then there was when we were finally home eating Renee's fabulous tacos with the fixing and Kai inexplicably yelled, wait a minute, did I eat ashes? Because my belly really hurts. Hmm. And then there was the leaf baby. He is a perfect angel sent from heaven. I mean, the child doesn't cry. He got cheated on practically every nap and still all day he simply stared lovingly into my eyes. So there's that. And there was the end of the day when I was getting the kids into bed. Chinua is away for a few days to sing at his friend's wedding. And I pulled Adora the Explorer and asked about what their favorite parts of the day were. And Kai said driving. And I said that story about the paper towels. And then I asked Kenya and she echoed towels. And then we sang and we prayed and I felt this burst of happiness. Like finally we were on top of the day and the day was not on top of us. And all the craziness and my sadness and missing one of my best friends who moved away faded into the night. And then the kids were sleeping and the house was quiet. And I sat down and checked all my working parts and found that everything still worked. And then I just listened to the quiet. August 7th, 2006. Over the weekend, some very kind people came to the land to do some work on various projects we have in the mix. They were mostly men except for one tall and fabulous woman named Nancy, who was housemates with one of the most amazing women I know, my friend Amelia. Amelia of the fudge and knitting and PG tips tea. Also of the sushi and Wendell Berry and hours of listening to me talk. Also German pancakes on Christmas morning with orange syrup. Ah, Amelia. Anyways, although I don't know Nancy as well, I always love to sit and talk with her when I get the chance. We end up talking about tall girl stuff. The rest of the crew were men. They had manly trucks and manly five-gallon buckets with tool belts strapped to them, and they installed wood stoves and fixed plumbing and split firewood. It was great. They took to calling Kai Max. 
Hi, Max, they would all chime when he came near. He hated it. No, 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 he would exclaim, making little chopping motions in the air with his hands, like he does when he's really sincere. I'm not Max. They laughed and said, okay, Max. This kind of rough uncle teasing is not my favorite approach to kids. I mean, when Kai asked me the other day if we could play goofball instead of foosball, I tried my best not to laugh at him. But I figured if these incredibly kind guys found this amusing, probably other people who wander in and out of Kai's world will tease him in the same way. In the past, I have asked people not to tease him. Eddie, please don't pretend to put him in the cooking pot on the stove. But I figured that Kai is getting old enough to learn how to deal with teasing. So I took him aside at one point when he seemed to be getting really distressed and told him that he should just say something silly back to them. When they called him Max, he could say, Hi, Zizzerzazzerzuz, or he could just call them Max right back. He brightened immediately and walked back over to where the guys were working. Hi, Max, one said cheerfully. Kai looked up. My mama says that I should call you Max back. It was like that for the rest of the day. I couldn't explain to him that he should just say hi, Max, back to them because he would always say, my mama said, and it was so sweet because he's so little and I'm a hero to him. It was a good example, though, of something I've been mulling over, which is how to deal with people who don't always have the script that you want them to have. I've learned that in my own life, but now with my kids, it's a challenge again. I'm used to people making comments about my dreads, and I'm used to what used to happen before I had dreadlocks, which was that old ladies would approach me and tell me that they paid hundreds of dollars to get their hair to have the ringlets that I had naturally. But what I'm having to get used to is all the comments that I get when I'm out with my kids. Are those your kids? Wow, they're so beautiful. Can I touch her hair? What a gorgeous little girl. They've got the good skin, huh? Wow, look at this hair. Are those your kids? And there's the now famous, how much do you get paid for two? That was what a lady asked me when we lived in San Francisco, and I had Kai in Kenya at the playground in the Panhandle Park where mostly nannies hang out with their charges in the middle of a weekday. So I can excuse her. I told her that I wasn't getting paid, and if she found someone who wanted to pay me, could she please contact me? She was flustered and said, Oh, it's just that they're so beautiful. People say beautiful instead of dark-skinned, but what they really mean is, you're white and these children are people of color. Are they really yours? But although I don't usually mind comments about our family or the things people say, it is starting to bother me a little. Maybe because the addition of a third child has upped the ante and more and more people have started to approach me in grocery stores. Part of this can probably be attributed to the fact that we look a little like a circus act with Kai doing handstands and Kenya doing her best impression of a tightrope walker. I was complaining to my superstar husband about this on the phone the other night, all the questions about whether I really was the mother of these children. Ray, he said, you're really going to have to find a way to deal with this because you'll be dealing with it for the rest of your life. Yeah, I said, but it's just that they ask if they can touch Kenya's hair and stuff. Welcome to my life. Welcome to the rest of our life. You'll just have to come up with a good response. So just like Kai, I'll have to come up with a high max of my own. I'm just not sure what that will be. Or I could say, my husband told me to say, August 16th, 2006. It's been a long time since I wrote, which is not good. It's not good because what happens is a sort of traffic jam in my head, which causes me to get absolutely stumped, wondering what to write about. What to write about? Well, I could write about why I haven't written in so long about the fact that my family is on vacation and how there is nothing in the world like spending some time alone with your family. And I'm not really saying there is nothing more blissful than spending time alone with your family, although it is much needed time, I will add, since I live in a community and rarely spend a day alone with my family. There's just nothing like it. It is blissful at times, frustrating at times, as my superstar husband and I begin to decompress and then attempt to communicate the long overdue stuff with one another, which is like getting the ketchup out of the bottom of the ketchup bottle. 
Having a deep conversation with this particular wife is also a little like conversing with Alibaba and the 40 thieves. There are a lot of us in here. I do want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, now I do again. Now I just want to snarl at you. Now I'm picking an outright fight. Okay, let's talk nicely again. Okay, happiness, we're talking. We're working things out because everyone knows that marriage is a long raft ride in a lovely green river with rapids here and there that need to be navigated with care. It's just that I feel sorry for Chinua, that he has to be in the raft that has the crazy person in it, sometimes paddling, but sometimes trying to hit him in the head with the oars, sometimes even stabbing the raft with a pencil on purpose, just so we have to sit on the bank for a while with a patch kit. And that brings me to something else, something I can barely even write about, but really feel like I have to. I noticed someone of a theme as I went back over my previous writing. There was a suspiciously large amount of entries about me crying in public or freaking out in stores because people were looking at me or getting upset because the checkout lady was talking to me in a mean tone of voice. And there is a lot of writing about anxiety. And you have to understand that there are many, many things in life that I am never anxious about. For example, germs. Go ahead, kids, eat those crackers off the ground, seven second rule. This is one reason that I do so well in India, I believe. People like me were made for travel in countries like India, which have, let's say, issues with sanitation. I'm going to be ridiculously open here and confess to you that as a kid, I ate a lot of gum off the ground. My poor mother was always asking me what I had in my mouth. Nothing, I would say, as I tried to hide a large wad of someone else's watermelon gum under my tongue. Obviously, I regret this decision to eat gum off the ground as a child, simply because it's a little embarrassing. But really, I never ever worry about germs. Money, most of the time. I've lived a life of faith for so long that I'm pretty good now at relaxing and allowing God to take care of us. We work pretty hard for no pay, and somehow God always brings us what we need. Like this place to rest, a place that Jesse and her husband Levi offered to us, and we received joyfully because God always likes to work through people. He rarely showers mountains of money out of the sky, but there seems to be a different way of living, an economy made of people who give to each other in different ways at different times. Now, I have had times of near heart attack with money, I'm not going to lie, such as when our community lived in this crazily expensive flat on Haight Street and I was in charge of collecting rent and paying bills. If there is any job in the entire world, that I should not be in charge of ever again, it is collecting rent. Disaster. I'm not super fearful. I travel a lot, have been in fairly dangerous circumstances a lot, and yet don't find that I'm really all that worried that something bad will happen to me or my family. I find it easy to believe that everything will somehow be okay. I know that we could be in danger, that things could heat up here, that one day in India I could be put in a bad position, But I also know that God often doesn't give us the ability to go through hard things until we need it. I don't lie awake worrying about money, sickness, danger, or potential disaster. I do lie awake worrying about people. I have a lot of anxiety when it comes to people and social situations. At the best, I can be a good friend, listen to people, be in public, and not be terribly self-conscious, and go to sleep at night easily. At the worst, I flinch when people look at me in public, am afraid of talking to people, and am knotted up inside at night, worrying. After a conversation, I may go over what I said obsessively, wondering if anything was wrong or upsetting or offensive. I'm coming to think that I need to seriously address this. But how? It is the hardest thing I have ever faced in my life. Why am I so afraid? What am I afraid of? I guess I'm going to have to continue to write it all down. I think I could seek a diagnosis and probably find one, but I'm reluctant to do that. I don't want to be contained within an illness. There are many parts to a mountain. There are the trees, the rough patches, the old stones, that dirt underneath. There is the sky coming all the way down to touch the dry earth, the occasional wildflower, and then there are wide open spaces. I am not made only of the parts of me that are sick and hiding, and I hope that healing is more than surgery, more than medicine, more than a band-aid. 
I don't know why I am so afraid of people being angry with me. I don't know why I feel a sort of constant judgment humming underneath the ground. I have seen those open spaces. I know there are many trees to climb through to get there, and I know there will be the small flowers in the trees, the glimpses of blue sky to help me through. God is a true friend. He neither allows me to escape this, nor allows it to break me. And there is my superstar husband who, when I am wild with fear over the days ahead of me, the people I will disappoint, the mistakes I will make, looks me in the eyes and says, you only have today. You only have this moment. August 26, 2006. If you ever want to juggle fire on the beach and you're hoping for a crowd, just park yourself next to a bonfire with many, many teenagers standing around it. They will not be able to contain themselves and you'll find yourself surrounded by odd, cheering fans who will either shriek and scream in delight, oh my god, if they're female, or say, oh dude, that's sweet, check that out, if they're bros. Teenagers are so great. They almost always make me tear up, partly because I remember what it felt like to be a teenager, how I was almost coming out of my skin with ideas and humiliation and the wonder of the universe, and also because there is nothing quite like the paradox of a teenager, how self-conscious and free they are. They're all like, oh my God, someone's looking at me, and then screaming in exhilaration as my superstar husband catches the torch by the flame. Ouch. Seriously, though, Chinua is amazing, and he did gather quite a crowd. It was really fun. And the great thing about Southern California is that everyone is so laid back. The fire department showed up to keep an eye on things, but no one asked Chinua to stop. My son, while trying to eat a hot pot sticker, said very seriously, it's not hot on my white teeth, only on my gum teeth. I'm very proud to be his mother. Yesterday we went to Mexico and it was a combination of being the best experience that I've had in a long, long time, and being a day of me trying to get away from myself. I was looking around and loving where I was, loving my beautiful family, loving Mexico, loving the beach and the taco stand, and my husband. Chinua can get along well enough in Spanish, with a good enough accent that people take him to know it fluently, and the train of conversation takes off with him clinging to the sides. I loved Mexico from the first day I was there, seven years ago, and my innocent pre-India self was amazed and intrigued by the messiness of the streets and the pinned-together houses. Chinua and I, longing to leave America for a while and travel, drank it in yesterday like thirsty sailors. But there it was, the anxiety, that knot in my gut that never left, the tension in my neck that curled around my spine and yanked, the sick feeling that had me in tears a few times. I hate myself like this. I don't know how to love myself like this. And even worse, I don't know how to believe that God loves me like this. And then I went swimming by myself while the kids and their superstar dad made a sand castle on the beach. I stood in the waves and was knocked off of my feet again and again. And I thought, yes, this is how it feels. This is why I never catch my breath. I pretended that the waves were my fear and my loneliness, pretended that if I could just stay standing, I would beat all this, that I would feel like Ray again, like that teenage self who can scream and shriek in delight. And then I let myself be carried for a while, and I was tired, and I wondered if I could let go enough to let the waves of this great fear hit me, yet still see the sunset, like I was seeing it around me, the sherbet colors, the sparkly horizon, and I rested, and I breathed deeply, and watched the silhouetted fishing boats with their circles of birds. Hi friends! So here are the hindsight notes for this episode. And this one is episode 4. The notes are from July 2006 to August 2006. Lots of stuff happened in these chapters, in these posts as we traveled and did the things we did. So here are my notes and my thoughts about those days. I still can't believe when I look back the kinds of things we used to do with so many babies. Um, when I look at myself back then, I'm like, wow, Ray, you're doing a really good job. 
I'm really glad we did the things we did. They were such good adventures. I wish maybe that I had a little bit more awareness of how momentous some of the things were so that I was a little easier on myself. But I don't regret any of it. It, it was beautiful. When I left the Rainbow Gathering that time, I remember walking all the way to the place where I stayed and I took a bus and I had to walk from the bus. There was like a free bus that went into town. We were in a place called Steamboat Springs and I just couldn't do the Rainbow Gathering anymore. So I left. So they dropped me off at this church and then I would take the bus into town to buy stuff with all the kids, with Kai and Kenya and Leafy. Um, usually I had Kenya on my back and Leafy on my front and would hold Kai's hand. And then we, yeah, we found this place. It was a church where I was able to stay on the floor and maybe they had some couches or something, I think. And it was, yeah, it was a nice place to stay. I mean, it was a church. It was full of sound equipment and, you know, a foosball table or whatever they had there for their youth group. But um, they opened up to us. And, yeah, just thinking about walking around. We went to a concert, I remember, on the hillside. It was like a little resort town, you know. They really weren't so sure about having us, all of us rainbows there. The story about the trash boy incident, when Chinua called Derek trash boy, and then we got left at the rest stop in Utah is so funny. I have told this story so many times. I'm really glad that I wrote it down at the time too, because remembering and looking back and reading over it is so great. I love that I got left at a rest stop by my husband in the middle of the night, you know, like... Oh, it's such a funny memory. Uh, it almost makes up for the fact, actually, that I got Wookie, the, our dog, with, you know, against Chinua's will while he was away. Uh, I feel like this incident is almost equal to that. So I really should remind him of this incident. Incident. He's probably forgotten it in his mind because I get a lot of flack for getting the dog. But also, maybe it has neither of those things have anything to do with each other and... I should just quit while I'm ahead. But the fact that little baby Kai rescued me and came out and was like, where's mama? <laughs> it's just so great. Such a great story. So yeah, so we left the rainbow gathering and we went to this church. And it was like a church bathroom. They had a shower and it felt like luxury after the woods. And yeah, the little kids. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned this a little bit before, but the town really didn't want rainbows to be there and if you guys don't know what a rainbow gathering is it's a group of hippies usually that get together to camp in the woods you've maybe heard of burning man this is like pre-burning man they had these gatherings and there's no money involved uh, they have a magic hat that you can put money into to help pay for meals but everything is given they can be quite wild we often go there when we would go there, we would go as Shakina Cafe um, was the first sort of time that we started using the word Shakina. And we would just make a space where we bake cookies and, and had our own kitchen, like a Jesus devotional kitchen. There's lots of different kitchens that go that are Jesus kitchens or other kinds of kitchens. Um, Sprouts kitchens, Shut Up and Eat It kitchen. There's all these different kitchens. And the kitchens are kind of like a little camp that people set up. So there, at Nationals, where we were, there can be up to 30,000 people. There are a lot of people. And people basically make their kitchens from stuff they find on the forest floor. So it's a lot of people that come into some town somewhere near a national park. And the townspeople don't always love it. And this one was a bit fancy because it is a ski town, Steamboat Springs in Colorado. So there were signs, like people didn't want us to be there. There was a bit of a blockade, even though it was legal. Um, we got citations at some point, and then we went to court. The court was like, don't worry about it. I, I'm trying to remember what the court looked like. It was so interesting. I remember we all had to go to court at one point. I remember crying when I talked to the cops because I always cry when I talk to cops. It's just like a, an instant, like, weird authority thing. Um, they gave us a bit of a slap on the wrist. I don't think we had to pay anything. 
And then some signs around town were sort of in support, like, we love you, rainbows. Thanks for coming to our town. You know, thanks for buying our stuff or coming to our shops. So, but when you went into the hardware store, like nothing was left, all the pipe, everything, you know, would, that you would need to set up a gathering to get, usually they would have pipe that would come from springs or, or creeks somewhere. So all of it was gone. This one didn't have very good water, a good water situation, which was why we left early. And I was just exhausted. The whole time I was there, I only saw one other person that had three kids, like in my age group, my kids age group. And she was a Jewish woman from the Jewish kitchens. And that same thing has happened many times where I've had the most kids out of everyone I know in a traveler community. But maybe there's one other woman who has a, um, a woman from the Jewish kitchen in Arumble had five kids or four kids maybe. And yeah, so I'm always kind of identifying with, with these other women. I'm glad I've had some time in the heat to prepare me for life in Asia. Um, that was good. Um, when we were in Varanasi, yeah, it was, we, I wrote, told a story about when we were in Varanasi and since then we've definitely been in that kind of heat as well. But that might have been one of the worst because we couldn't move from place to place because of this curfew that was going on. It would have been much worse, though, if we had had kids there. Like that was living the single life where you just do what you need to do to survive and you're not worried about your kids not being able to sleep at night. We just lay around on the rooftops in wet clothes with the fan on us. But thinking about being at the land, in the heat, at the river with the little kids, oh, it's beautiful. Those are beautiful memories. I read the stuff I write about anxiety and I think about how far I've come and how much I've really started to understand myself and understand how I can, how I get set off, how I can bring myself back. And I'm really proud of young Ray for finding these, figuring these things out. Um, I'm very Proud of young Ray for finding that writing is such an important tool to her. I'm proud of her for figuring it out without much therapy, even though I could have really used some. Yeah, I read so many books. I had, I did have postpartum depression with all of my kids. I think now they add um, so much changes so quickly, you know. Now they have PPD and A, so postpartum depression and anxiety, which I hadn't heard of that term when I had it, but... Yeah, I definitely had it with all my kids. There's also one, I can't remember what the acronym is. Could have done a little research, I guess. But there's a disorder where you really respond to letting down milk with a lot of sadness. I had that with every child and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know that there, you know, there was actually a name for it. I don't even know if people were naming it yet. So... Yeah, pretty soon after these, like about a, within the year after this, I start to understand that I need to take medication. So this time, this stuff that I'm writing about right now is where I had three kids in four years and I was going through a lot and I didn't yet know that I, I really needed some medication for anxiety. So I am proud of me. I'm proud of me for getting through it, for figuring out some rules, like making sure that I get enough sleep. Um eating regularly, all that kind of stuff. Those things still stand. And I still love the poem at the end of this episode. So thank you for listening, and I hope you join next time. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for listening to the Journey Mama Writings podcast. I just wanted to hop on here and let you know again where you can find me. First of all, credit goes out to Chinua Ford, right? the incredible song that goes along with the podcast. He did such an amazing job of writing this beautiful song, and I'm so thankful for that. I am all around the web. I have new things coming out right now. I just released a book of poetry. You can find that everywhere that you can find books on the internet. But first of all, you can find it. It's called Everything Bright, Clear, and Beautiful, A Year of Poetry. You can find it and all my other books at journeymama.com forward slash books. I also have a newsletter that goes out once a month. You can subscribe to that at journeymama.com forward slash subscribe. You can also read my blog at my website, journeymama.com. 
You can find me at Instagram. I am at Journey Mama. You can also become a patron and sponsor this podcast and many of my other works. So yeah, there's lots of places to find me around the web. Follow along. We love to have new people in this little community. And I'm so thankful that you are listening and reading along. Oh, also a special announcement. Next month, July 25th, the sixth book in the World Whisperer series comes out. If you have not read this series yet, go and find World Whisperer on Amazon. Just search for World Whisperer. It's free as an ebook. I am currently recording the audiobook to it. And yeah, you, you'll love it. So the sixth book, the last book in the series comes out next month on July 25th.